Hello world of YouTube and welcome to the Listing Log Update for February of 2024. I've got nine new albums that I spun over the last month that I'm going to be talking about in this video with time codes listed in the description for each individual review if you want to skip around in the video. I didn't really do any of the request catch-up I've got to do. I mostly kind of kept my sort of new release radar scoops in check and did a little bit of catch-up because some genuine gems dropped in January that I wanted to talk about and some stuff that I was hyped for also came out that I was just really wanting to hear how it uh, came together. Either way, let's go ahead and get started. Thank you so very much for watching and give it a like if you're excited. You turn into a stranger. I need to you turn to come and get you. Let's keep it I started my month with the Lyrical Lemonade uh, compilation All Is Yellow and I mostly just wanted to see how all of these collaborations would line up because there are some uh, personal favorites throughout the roster. I mean, I saw Amine was in the track listing, and obviously Denzel and Kid Cudi, who I ended up talking about later on uh, in this month. But there were also some other things I was kind of curious about. I had seen a snippet of the Juice World and Corday collaboration on TikTok, and I was like, okay, it's kind of interesting because I've been kicking around the idea of doing a remix of Role Model because I think that that is one of the better... Uh, beats from that record but while I still think it's kind of weird which like I talked about in the Kid Cudi and Sana review of like the continued use of artists like X and Juice uh, recordings in these collaborations I think it's just kind of in poor taste especially with some of the ones that have been done with Juice in particular while I think Corday is great on there and I think that the beat switch up for part two with Eminem is kind of a fun moment. With other collaborations I would say holistically coming together like Ski Mask and J.I.D. on the opener I think have some strong chemistry. Um, I like the Lil Durk and Kid Cudi song uh, more than I don't. I think that it's a really cool sort of nice chill little bop and while I didn't give Tizo's record from last year a spin I want to listen to uh, his record now after hearing uh, him on here because I think he kills it, honestly. But as a whole, I don't think a lot of these tracks left me with much of a lasting impact by and large. I think Chief Keef and Lil Yachty are fine on Say Your Grace. And I wish I liked Amine and Sway Lee and Lotto on Special more, but I feel like all of them aren't really popping off on that song. I think the best moments throughout the entire back, like five or six tracks, are Equilibrium, which is a decent enough cut, and Dave on Stop Giving Me Advice, which pairing him with Jack Harlow is just a wild collaboration that I don't think works whatsoever. And again, Tizo on Hummingbird, because I think that while that track is solid, is definitely the strongest part of it. As a whole, I didn't find myself pulling uh, as much from this as I may have hoped, but it's also a sort of collaboration from a video production studio, right? So like how good could it really have been? Which I would say probably lands this with me at a, at a four. I think that it's got some decent ideas. It's got some tracks that I think are good, but not enough, I think, nearly stuck with me for me to put this anywhere uh, near a caliber of good quality. I had seen Irish shoegaze band New Dad popping up in a couple of feeds of mine for like recommended and I decided to dive into their debut Madra and I think it is a pretty solid little indie pop group. I love their sort of interpretation of this dreary shoegaze filled environment with these guitars that both add a nice texturing with some bite to accent the choruses, like on Sickly Sweet, which I think is a catchy ass jam with a nice lead bass line. The bass work on this project as a whole, I think is choice as hell. The bass work on Where I Go, I think has this nice little groove that dances with the drums when it comes in. I think it carries the energy throughout In My Head pretty strongly as well. I love the way this album ebbs and flows so very strongly as well bouncing between those energetic tracks I mentioned with some of the more lower key, emotionally driven moments like Let Go. That also helps accent the feeling of directionlessness on Where I Go, which has, again, another really good 
bite to its guitar added to send its chorus over the edge. This is just a really solid, well put together debut from this group. Some components like a little bit more density. I do feel like feels more sparsely placed throughout the back end that I wish crept in a little more often. You know, while I think Dream of Me is another fucking bop with a strong chorus, uh, the sort of sprinkling into the end of the record after that, I feel like could use a little more to push it there, you know? Like on a track like Nightmares, uh, while the title track has a nice sort of punch into its chorus, um, and Nightmares has a nice little build up throughout its track listing, I feel like it could just use a little more to like send it to the moon like some of the other highlights on here. I still think this is a fucking solid ass album though, and a really strong uh, step forward, first step forward for this band. It just leads this feeling a little more front heavy as far as like having a little more variety across its sonic, uh, the use of the sonic palette. I still think if you enjoy uh, sort of dreamy, uh, catchy, shoegaze inspired indie rock, I think that this is a pretty solid group that I'm actually excited to see where they go from here if they decide to. I, I'm giving this a 7 out of 10. I think it's a solid ass album that has some tracks that I'll definitely keep in my rotation with a couple of choice bops that I would say stand out and help sort of excel this band as far as pretty decent songwriters on top of that. The trio of Radiohead's Tom and John with another Tom thrown in the mix. The Smile dropped their sophomore outing, Wall of Eyes, back in January. And I knew I wasn't going to get the chance to get to it then, but I really wanted to get to it sooner rather than later because I loved their, um, their debut and I was curious to see where they take their sonic direction, if anywhere, or just decided to flesh out sort of the... The ideas they presented us and I think that they more chose the latter on here but I think that they do so in some pretty cool and uh, dazzling moments that even have some absolutely well accented payoffs throughout some of the more lower key passages on here that I think broaden their horizons in ways that truly uh, excel you know while I, I think that the sort of slow quirky build behind Wall of Eyes uh, does a good job of sort of lulling the listener in with its more acoustic foundation. I love that throughout every moment after that, while it keeps some of that mellow sort of ideology, the group does grip the listener and throw them into some interesting territories like uh, the crescendo throughout Read the Room that just gets so unnerving. I love the groove that erupts throughout Under Our Pillows and I think is just a tight ass jam that brings the listener on this really cool journey. That sort of mellow glitchy groove that sits under I Quit sort of dances with the strings in this beautiful harmony as well. I love the use of strings on this as a whole and I think further widens and sort of like adds to this group's sonic palette. I, just, I like this. I like this a lot. I think that it's a really strong follow-up. Uh, there's some moments that I do feel like while having good moments like that they build to do take a little while to get there like on Bending Heretic. I don't think You Know Me is the strongest closer either. Admittedly while I think the groove underneath I Quit is interesting I don't think it's nearly as dazzling or uh, just creates this incredible moment like Friend of a Friend does. It's still a hell of a follow-up that obviously I feel like was going to be a knockout of the park. These three are very talented musicians that have really good chemistry together as that debut showed. I'm just glad that they decided to drop another record because I liked that last one and I like this one probably a little bit more, but jury's out as to how long that'll stick with me or if it's just sort of recency bias. I'm still giving this an eight. I'm giving it the same score I gave that last one because I think that they're both really, really good, but they haven't made that full experience that I would say enraptures me in the same way that some of the highs I've seen Tom and John make in throughout their musical careers. While I knew the remaining members of Static X were working on a second 
Project Regeneration. I'll admit, I didn't have as high of interest or hopes as I was for the first one. While I thought the first one was like a nice little touching send-off potentially or like rebirthing of this band because they were teasing like another vocalist in the group. Uh, this follow-up, I don't think, captures that same spirit. And I feel like, even in, in Genesis, felt a little less interesting because it is intentionally just a follow-up record with more of Wayne's stuff. And I don't think that some of the meshings of the ideas uh, come together all as fruitfully either. Stuff like Tone or No Hope uh, feel a lot more slapdash as far as like piecing together the ideas than anything that was on Volume 1. While I enjoy the still cybernetic leaning palette that the group is leaning with on here, I think that these guys just need to creatively do something else because there's even moments that I feel like they get overshadowed in the mix, like on Just In Case Boy, where I feel like Again, the the growled vocals and even some of the bass gets buried under the this electro palette in a way that I think kind of defeats the purpose of a project like this, you know? I'll still take a track like Just In Case Boy over a track like Kamikaze or some of the more slapdash tracks, though. I also think Stay Alive is a pretty strong opening track that I think reintroduces this concept at least really strongly. The sort of haunting sound that closes this with From Heaven, I think, is a sort of at least well-constructed finale. It has this haunting sound to it that I think captures an energy that does evoke what this project is supposed to be about in concept. I do think tacking on bonus tracks at the end kind of defeats that, uh, but he... One of them is at least a Nine Inch Nails cover and a really decent one, at least by Static X's standards for covers. It's still not my favorite Nine Inch Nails cover, but it beats the fuck out of any of their 80s covers that they dropped for Cult of Static. Either way, I don't really... I don't like this project nearly as much. I just don't think it's as strong. Uh, it just feels less cohesive in some regards. And I think that out of the two, the first one is absolutely the better. I'm going to give this a five. It's not like the worst thing I've heard, but it's certainly one of the worst things this group of musicians has decided to pull together. While I may not have been the biggest fan of their last album, Crawler, in comparison to a decent chunk of the rest of the discography, I'm never going to count Idols out because... Crawler acted as a sort of firmer sonic pivot, and sometimes some bands just don't make the best transitional records. I know this band at least has talented musicians at the helm, and with, you know, a proper retooling and a sort of revisit, a better follow-up I could see ringing out from Crawler. And with Tank, I would say we have gotten that, because... This sees the band reworking with Kenny Beats, but bringing Nigel Godrich to add a sort of creative touch to this project. Like, you can feel there's a little more of a, a broadening out within the hard pivot that was in parts of Crawler. But I think that the focus of the record and the overall cohesion that rings out from that focus in, in sort of lyrics... I think creates a more fruitful listen on this and I think accents some of those more electronic dance inspired elements like the interlude grace or the incredible banger pop 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 that I think has this great meltdown that the track builds to fantastically. I love the use of electronics as well on the opener Idea One. Those pianos, again, that's some godridge ass sound and shit, especially with some of the synth stuff too. But I mean that in the best way possible. I also like Dancer. I'm glad that they got to work with LCD Sound System while 
uh, maybe not the band I would have initially pegged for them to work with. I think that they come together into a pretty damn good song on there. I also love the Rager Hollow Notes. I think that that's a really catchy ass sort of dip back into their own grittier sounds that I think sticks to the landing pretty strongly. I also think the use of hollow notes on that track as this lyrical allegory for being at odds with your partner is well accented, especially given recent news. The way that sort of dance-inspired energy throttles the more paranoid-tinged gratitude, I think, adds to some of the tension that the back half of the record just sort of excellently ramps up in some subtle ways. I like this record a lot. I think that it is a stronger outing than Crawler, and I think that it is definitely a more cohesive feeling project without feeling sort of as sloppily sort of planted in some sequencing regards as that was. I'm gonna give this an eight. I think this is a really strong album. Maybe not my favorite, but I think that it is a hell of a good follow-up and sort of doubling down on one's own desire to further explore other sonic and lyrical avenues. I hate that we didn't make it to forever. Probably ain't getting back. When I watched Usher perform during the Super Bowl this past month, I realized that while I know a smattering, and I mean a large smattering, of Usher singles, the only record of his I've ever spun is Confessions. So I figured I would rectify that, at least by starting with his latest record, given he was promoting it uh, at the end of the Super Bowl performance. And I had heard at least some of the singles from this record before this release, so it was kind of nice to actually dive into an Usher record during its release cycle, you know? Because I think Good Good is a decent enough sort of bop. I think that Summer Walker and him have some nice chemistry together. 21's verse very much feels very 21, uh, but he creates an interesting sort of other side of what Summer and Usher are talking about that feels in the same realm, and it's his own sort of perspective on that. I think that there's an interesting sort of through line throughout this project that makes it feel like Usher's on this weekend back home, and he decides to have a fling. And I think that it, like, listening to the record with that sort of framework is interesting. I don't know if that's his intended sort of vision, but there's a sort of pacing throughout this, especially when going from good good into a town girl it feels like sort of a look back on someone's memory before an update on where they are now i think the a town girl is a decent collaboration with lotto as well i love the collaboration with the dream cold-blooded and i think that uh the two-piece kissing strangers and keep on dancing as far as like P painting a scene, running into somebody at the club, and then continuing that sort of narrative with just dancing with them after seeing them with somebody else is an interesting sort of two-piece that I think sits together well. They're two really strong tracks at, at also. It does get very on the nose, but in a, in a, in a decent way on, on the side with exploring those themes. This sort of back and forth and feeling for somebody that you're definitely feeling as a so sort of side piece back in your hometown, this weekend fling sort of energy. This record does commit something that I would say is a faux pas in uh, bringing records together when you're including like soundtrack cuts. I do think that Risk It All does try to at least in a, in a broader sense tie into some of the, the themes, but I just don't think that the track still fits within the confines of the record. I think it's a solid song. You know, I didn't, I hadn't heard it before this, but I think that Usher and her come together pretty well on there. I don't necessarily hate the very tongue-in-cheek tracks like Big. Uh, they are very playful in a fun sort of way. I love the sort of vibrancy that the each sort of reprise brings throughout the track. Uh, but there's other tracks on here that I don't think come together quite as strongly as that, like on Bop. Uh, Stone Cold Freak tries to have this sort of, like, southern groove to it that I think 
I've heard artists do better. I've probably heard him do better, honestly. And I'll admit, honestly, I think that this album is front-loaded as fuck compared to the back end. It's still solid. It's still got some decent tracks at the back end, but I would argue there's a definite fall-off in, like, the bangers to non-bangers in the back half of the record. Um, and I don't know if that's just because by that point in the quote-unquote narrative, uh, Usher has left the club with this girl, but I don't know. Some of the back half, I just don't think it's strong as the front half. It's it's still a solid record, and I think that like I'm gonna walk away from this with some definite tracks that I'm gonna throw on rotation, especially if I'm like in a social gathering. I feel like there's some fun, catchy ass jams in here, and I think that Usher at this point in career, it doesn't sound like he's really trying to prove as much, but I feel like he's he's still writing some choice jams in spite of that. I'm giving this a six. It's solid. It's so very solid, but I would argue there's a definite drop off at the track listing. Right down to also tacking together like a remix at the very end of the project. You guys may or may not know this, but I love Chelsea Wolf's music, or at least the stuff of hers that I've dove it into. The only time I've covered her on the channel for the listening log was back in 2019 with Birth of Violence, which was admittedly a solid, if not fully well-realized, more acoustic-leaning pivot, in my opinion. I loved Blood Moon, though. I think she worked really well with Converge, and I thought that it was easily one of my strong, like, personal favorites from 2021. It was in my top 50, even if it was supposed to be in the December listening log for that year. But I think that her follow-up, she reaches out to, she reaches out to, she uh, sees her fully successfully realigning and repivoting into this more brooding, electronic-driven realm that I think she just captures fantastically. There's a mood to this that I think sits amongst the densities and electronic, industrial-inspired grooves that I think it haunting at moments, like on Everything Turns Blue, where she really creates this well-harnessed, loud, quiet dynamic where she you know, dances over this groove that gets just washed out with this noisy-ass chorus. You know, I think that the sort of build throughout the opener, Whispers in the Echo Chamber, creates this gritty-as-hell uh, sonic palette that she just cuts through like a knife with that same haunting energy. I also think that for as, like, noisy as that track sounds in the background everything just feels buried in a way that I, I i don't think it's the best sort of cohesion on the project you know eyes like nightshade has this erratic feel to its percussion that uh i think is accented well with these electronic clang you know the the addition of like reverse tapes add to that sort of uneasy presentation as a whole i think there are some cool production ideas on here there's a few moments where i think the production feels a little um not necessarily mishandled but there's components that i feel like don't come together throughout a whole track like salt <clears throat> the production on that track in particular especially with uh some of the vocal sampling it feels very inspired by a record like welcome oblivion by how to destroy angels but i don't think the backing vocals and all the, the, the noise buried beneath the uh, the reverb hits nearly as hard as, as it feels like it could, given her voice kind of sits where it does in the mix. I think Salt's a decent enough track, but it's one of the weaker moments because of its production. You know, sort of a point of comparison where I think using intimacy or using like a more minimal idea, but then adding this noise without losing that intimacy is a track like A Place in the Sun, which has this lower key piano. But like once that low end really comes in and just rattles, it adds to the density in a more sparse way that I think Chelsea just sounds fucking beautiful on. I think this is a strong ass album and I think that it's easily one of her best that I've heard in her catalog, and I like it on par with some of my other favorites of hers, like Abyss. I'm gonna give this an 8 out of 10. I think that it is strong as hell, and easily one of the best records I spun all month. The pain of the bubblegum dog is finally catching up. I made a post on Blue Sky talking about waiting for MGMT to drop before I did a discography review, and 
a record like this is kind of why because I couldn't have been more hyped for a new MGMT record after Little Dark Age. That record was a welcoming back that showcased some really cool sonic experiments for them that I think paid off splendorously with some subject matter that I think was handled gracefully. And with Loss of Life, while it is another sonic pivot for them that more sees them adapting realms of their roots i think that it's still sonically interesting it's just not nearly as consistently interesting as little dark age it's still a solid ass record i'm gonna get that out of the way uh, up front it's not nearly their worst record but it is a record that meanders in some spots that i don't think creates a tight or at least consistently fruitful listening experience, quite like some of their highs in their discography. I do really love the production on this though, and I will say that it's maybe as well produced to work for its sonic direction as Little Dark Age. Like those acoustic guitars on Mother Nature, the synth production on the title track, on both parts of the title track, especially part one that sends the record out uh, in a really nice ambient place. That same attention being paid to that guitar, but in a different way on Bubblegum Dog to let that track's more lyric focused uh, ideas uh, sit stronger with the listener. The way that track explodes in its chorus too is just fucking choice. I like the 90s ass adaptations that they're experimenting with, but I also like a lot of stuff that this is inspired by. I also think that the coming together of them with uh, Christine and the Queens is, is pretty damn good on Dancing in Babylon. I like the synth stuff on there. I think that their voices pair fantastically together too. The production, I don't think, helps it in the same way that it does other moments like it. I do think it's sandwiched between some really strong tracks. Frady's song, going into I Wish I Was Joking, sort of creates this sort of lull in the record that I don't think sends it into the closer quite as strongly, especially given how low-key that closer is. That gangster love line is kind of weird, and I wish it was joking, even if that song is a fucking bop. <laughs> like, I wish it was joking is a really nice, dreamy track, but I think that, like, that point of the record needs, like, maybe a little bit of something. Uh, and People in the Streets is also, like, just a, it's a fine enough song. As a whole, this is a solid outing, though. I think. I'm giving it a 7. It's very much worth your time if you're a fan of like 90s alternative inspired stuff. Uh, you may not know MGMT for that, but their last record kind of had a similar vibe where they were just kind of doing something different. And I think that while this is definitely not as good of a handle as different, it's still a good, it's still a well handled shift in my opinion. I don't live in mind, baby, focus on mine. So when Kid Cudi announced that in just a month after Insano's release, he'd be dropping a sequel record to it called Insano Nitro Mega, I was morbidly curious because while I think Insano was a fumble, there were some interesting ideas he was wanting to put onto a project like this that I think actually come together really well and I think that if I'm comparing the two which is something I'll be doing later on this year as well I think that the abandoning of the DJ drama stuff helps this out the gate because while I like DJ drama and I think he does add energy to Insano I think that it unfortunately just leaves it compared to an album that is utilizing DJ drama thematically and just conceptually more creatively interestingly than on Insano. And I think that the Nitro version also has really good collaborations and production that I think goes more insane than parts of Insano. I think the opener, Human Made, has this nice energy to it that I think he tried to maybe channel on the first one, but just does better on here. I like a lot of the Chip the Ripper stuff, that's on here as well. That's a nice sort of throwback and lends to the sort of 
resurrecting of ideas that crops up later on on here. The beat on animate as a whole, I think, is dope as fuck. The two sort of come together on that and maybe the best of the whole project. I think that the other 90s sample flip on Crash Test Cuddy is insane but works insanely well with mm, with the crash test dummies i think that it is dope as shit honestly and i think that the use of the chorus like in the chorus the choral vocals some choice shit man i like the steve aoki sort of extended version of electro wave part two i like the introducing of a couple of tracks that were recorded in different eras of his career sort of finally coming to fruition on here like dose of dopeness from 2007 and rocket from 2011 while i can understand maybe why rocket didn't end up on any of the stuff he was working on around that time it's a solid jam that i think is one of the better guitar driven cutty stuff from that era dose of dopeness is a really good song and i'm kind of shocked he waited until now to drop it but it fits some of the energy that the record has, oddly enough, so I think that it, it, it's still a choice song and fits well on there. So does Rocket, honestly, and I think helps reinforce a track like All My Life, which is another decent enough cutty guitar jam. I don't know. This record is definitely a step up from Insano. It's still not necessarily my favorite cutty record. I think that out of the two outros, Superboy is definitely weaker. Kind of goes on for a little too long. Mood Man shit isn't quite nearly as good as the Wizard Smoke track from the other Insano. I really wanted more out of the Wiz Khalifa collaboration, honestly. It's it's not my favorite thing. It, it's not the worst thing that could have come from this concept, but it's definitely something that I kind of wish there was a little more going on there. There's other tracks like Chunky that I feel like kind of just pat out the runtime in ways that I don't think are all that fruitful. I don't know. I do like this more, but I'm trying to say that like for all the stuff that I do like, the stuff that I don't, uh, kind of nets it neutral like while I like seeing Chip the Ripper and uh, Willis is a Solid track it kind of feels like a weird whiplash moment in the track listing and those sort of tracks that I don't feel like add a whole lot like Ill what I bleed and chunky as far as like other album cut ass jams on here There's a lot again. There's more here that I like that I don't but I don't think it's close to uh, other records of his in his catalog that I think are classics. I'm still giving this a 6, because it is very solid, but its lows are some of the weaker moments that sort of bog down Insano a little more heavily. Expect a redacted on this later on in the year. And that was a listening long update. Did you like what I spun? Did you have thoughts on any of them? Let me know my thoughts on any of the records you did spun and the other stuff you'd like for me to spin in the comments down below. Again, if you like this video, give it a like. If you want to see more, consider subscribing. I drop two to four vids a week depending on what I've got going on. I do have the next Frogger going live this Saturday. Hopefully you're excited for that. Either way, thank you again so very much for watching. I've been Viral Rack. You guys will get days, lives, and situations. And I'll see you another day. Watch, 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 watch.